Good morning. It's Dr. Nick Tulo with the Saturday morning live stream live from New Jersey. It's uh, kind of a cold gray day and it's been good morning. Oops. <laughs> I hate when that happens. You can see the delay that happens. So if you ask a question, it does take about 10 seconds. Um, so yeah, it's cold and gray, but a little warmer than yesterday. It's been running like in the 30s. So uh, I um, haven't done this in a couple of weeks because we've been doing some crazy stuff, renovating part of the house. And uh, uh, as you can see, one of my cameras is missing. But uh, we're going to try to get some, to some interesting ECGs and I hope uh, impart some of my knowledge to you. If you guys are just tuning in, I uh, am a cardiac electrophysiologist, which is a great specialist to be because um, it's really a lot of fun. I get to do some surgery, implanting pacemakers and defibrillators. I get to do invasive procedures like uh, electrophysiologic testing and catheter ablation. And uh, primarily I'm interested in arrhythmias, but I also have a big practice in syncope and also autonomic dysfunction. So that's me. I spend about half the time in my office seeing patients and doing consults and follow-ups. But the other half of the time I'm at the hospital, if not doing a procedure, then making rounds. Most of the time I make rounds and uh, see patients, but I often run into residents. And if I go onto a unit, people will stop me and show me a cardiogram and say, hey, uh, doc, what do you think this is? And uh, that's actually one of the more fun parts of my job. So uh, I really uh, enjoy sharing my knowledge with young physicians and uh, uh, being an expert in something. You kind of have to be an expert in something. Um, and and I, I feel um, it, it, it's just fun kind of being able to just glance at an ECG and kind of feel comfortable enough knowing what's going on within like a couple of seconds. So uh, that's what I try to do uh, for you guys is to get you comfortable to the point where you won't get fooled and you'll look at an ECG and kind of know what's happening right away. So if you like this content, make sure that you click the link in the description and subscribe to my channel, share it with your friends. And if you want uh, more advanced topics, uh, then you can think about checking out ECG Academy, which is my formal online course using video tutorials to teach you all these crazy nuances about reading ECGs. But let's get to the case. It's actually, I'm not going to do a case presentation as much as I'm going to show you a couple of ECGs that were brought to me. And the first one is here, um, the uh, burn, I, I do a lot of work in the burn ICU. And um, in fact, I, I think I showed you guys um, a tracing from the burn ICU a couple of uh, weeks ago. But um, here they, they handed me this recording from one of the patients and they were concerned that the patient had um, what looked like atrial flutter because you know you had these rapid rapid um, beats here and in fact the these giant waves were picked up by the monitor and an alarm went off for because of a tachycardia of 163 beats a minute but they were concerned that the patient might need anticoagulation or something so you can see these very large waves um, and uh, then you can also see the QRS complexes and just, well, I see uh, Ricardo Vianello is, is uh, online again and um, um, Akshay Pandya, thank you for tuning in from India. I have, there are a lot of Indian residents at the uh, hospital that I work at, at and uh, a lot of people, a lot of my subscribers are from there. So thank you. And Dr. Chauvin, good morning to you also. Thanks for tuning in. So this, uh, al this alarm went off and at first glance, the residents were concerned that the patient might have atrial flutter and whether he needed some sort of anticoagulation. But it, it just looked weird, didn't it? I mean, doesn't this look weird? I mean, when do you see flutter waves that look that large? And uh, although you kind of like, as you look across, I always say, I always tell people, look at the forest first. Don't concentrate on the individual flutter waves. You have to really kind of look at the whole thing, get the gestalt of the whole strip. And, and what I see is that the QRS complexes are a little bit irregular. This is a longer interval and then you have a shorter interval here. But this, these, this weird flutter stuff is slower over here than it is in the beginning. And as you look across and see how it changes, it really, really slows down. 
um, to the point where it, it sort of seems to st almost stop and, and become like maybe 140 beats a minute. And then you have so this weird signal here and a couple last ones, and then the patient's in sinus rhythm. So what bothered me is that the ventricular rate didn't change. And then the other thing that bothered me is that we can see clearly that there are P waves in front of these QRS complexes. So this rhythm down here in the bottom two strips is clearly sinus, but there was a beat here, and, and you can even see a P wave here and one here. So how can you have atrial flutter or some kind of weird atrial tachycardia and sinus rhythm at the same time? You can't. So this, the answer to this is it's artifact. Brian Gomez from Houston. Good morning. Thank you for show. Thank you for for uh, for joining the the discussion, and and Dr. Chauvin's from Bangladesh. Thank you. Uh, this is so cool. I mean, this is like so neat. Every time I I uh, see people from all over the world interested in my teaching, and I really in, enjoy sharing it with you. So, um, oops, looks like I blew up my my not my computer, but the image. But see how you can't have. Um, an arrhythmia and sinus rhythm at the same time, certainly not atrial flutter fibrillation. So as soon as you see things competing with each other, with these big giant signals here, and at the same time you have a, what looks like a sinus P wave, you know it's artifact, right? Pure and simple, this has to be artifact. Uh, there is um, uh, very little that, there's nothing else it can be, really. Let me just try to make it there. So, so this is sort of like sometimes you can get mechanical interference and I actually showed um, a, another burn ICU patient who was getting uh, the uh, chest compression through the bed. The bed was shaking and that's why his pacemaker went faster. Go check that uh, live stream because uh, I have a whole library. This is like the 11th one I've done. So you can go back and watch those uh, if you if you like. You can find that link down, uh, down below in the description as well. But See, this, this is some sort of either something is shaking the wire or the patient is um, uh, brushing their teeth. That's a really common one. When the patient brushes their teeth and the monitor wires pick up the electrical activity of the pectoralis muscles, especially if the wires are put on the chest or on the arms. So this is just artifact and you have to just ignore it. And what, what the proof of the, uh, is that when you have an atrial rate of 300 or 250 or whatever, it gets down the AV node and drives the ventricle and you'll see a, a, a faster ventricular rate usually in someone who's in an atrial arrhythmia than you will when they finally convert to sinus. But down here, it really didn't seem like the, the ventricular rate changed at all and there he is in sinus. So this is just artifact. And they showed it to me and I was like, I just took one glance at it and I was like, this is artifact. And they're like, what do you mean? Are you sure? I, how, how can you tell? And this is the one thing that I always teach people. You know, when you look at a strip, the first question you shouldn't ask yourself is, oh, is the patient symptomatic? It doesn't matter. Um, don't ask, oh, what's the blood pressure? It doesn't matter. You look at the strip itself and uh, assess the quality of the recording. And the first question you need to ask yourself is not, is it atrial? Not, is it ventricular? The first question is, is it real? And in this case, it obviously is not real. And you can tell because you can't have a normal rhythm and artifact, a, a normal rhythm and an arrhythmia at, at the same time. So, um, so, so just remember that uh, always have um, a kind of jaundiced eye, always take things with a grain of salt, be um, um, uh, ch challenge what, what someone shows you and says, oh, look, I have atrial flutter. And, Are you sure it's atrial flutter? Let's just, you know, take a closer look at it. Be skeptical. And, and, that, and, and even when you think you know the answer, always say to yourself, who, what else could it be? Hmm, I wonder. If you look really carefully at this top strip, you can actually see um, um, here the <laughs> That, that, that there's a P wave right there that um, is, is happening in the middle of this all. And I'm sure you can pick out other P waves through this whole thing. So that's the first lesson. Just make sure you know that uh, this is a, is a good quality recording and that you're not dealing with artifact. Okay, so um, um, 
Zara is from Algeria and is joining us. Thank you so much. And Ricky Hua from uh, Myanmar. Thank you. I'm so, certainly glad. If you guys have any questions or anything, I'll try to glance over at the chat, uh, at, the, at the, um, the questions every now and then. But I'm just kind of getting used to this live thing. So uh, let's get to the next tracing. And uh, again, it was just like the residents came up to me and said, oh, duh. Dr. Tula, what do you think this is? This, you know, should we be concerned? Uh, is this torsad? And uh, I, I, it only takes a second to, to realize what this is. Um, yes, it looks like a very nasty, wide looking polymorphic type of thing. Um, but, but what bothers me now, you can take out calipers and you can go through that kind of exercise, but if you're looking at the whole picture, see, don't concentrate on the, this, this, this beat and this beat and this beat. Look at the whole picture. You have to train your eyes to, to, to look at the whole thing. Oops. Train your eyes to look at the whole thing. And if you look at the whole thing, um, you can see that there's something right here that looks a lot like the normal rhythm here. And then you have this as well. Now, if you took a pair of calipers, you'll find that that maps out perfectly. Now, you know, you might say, well, are you sure? Maybe that's just a little, you know, uh, jiggle of polymorphic uh, tachycardia. But look at the other strips too. You have, here's a normal QRS and here's a normal QRS, but you've got something that starts before the normal QRS. So, so there's like some kind of noise that's occurring even before the QRS starts. And then, and it's pretty easy to see, it's easy to pick these QRSs out. Um, and here and here as well. So this is artifact as well. Okay, you, even though it looks really nasty and you really kind of have to like think about, oh my God, check electrolytes. Well, it would be silly to go and check this person's magnesium when it's just, junk, right? <laughs> you, you have to really kind of uh, be able to see this. Uh, you have to look past all the squiggly stuff and recognize that there's still a QRS there. Uh, I always tell people you can't have like ventricular rates in excess of 300 beats per minute. So when you look at this signal and this signal, how do you explain this one in the middle? You can't, this, the, here this rate is, you know, uh, 160 or so. So if there are three QRS complexes, that would mean the rate's like over 300. And, you know, it, it's not physiologically possible to have so many signals in a row so, so close together. Here again, you have this signal that's going up and this one going down, and they're too close to each other for them both to be real. So this is not real. This is just artifact. Some, the wires got jiggled or something like that. And, and so the last one was an atrial artifact. This looks like VTAC, but it's not. So that's why you should never rely on pattern recognition. Don't look at it and say, oh my God, oh, 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 that looks like VTAC, you know, uh, I gotta call, you know, the attending, uh, especially at three o'clock in the morning, because then you'll get me on the phone and I'll be like, oh, all right, send me a picture, you know, which is great. You know, it's like, it used to be, I. I would have to get out of bed to go to the fax machine and now <laughs> you could just send me a picture on my uh, cell phone and I, and I could look at it and yell at you. That is not <laughs> real. <laughs> no, I don't yell. But, um, but you know, it, it, be, be confident that you know what you're dealing with and don't use a knee jerk reflex to say, well, it looks like VTAC, so, so we, better, we better do something. You, you take the time to analyze it. And if you analyze it, you'll realize that it's not real. So, okay. Um, now, um, now, I'm not going to spend any more time on artifact. I'm sure you're glad. But this is a very interesting strip. And, and, I, and, I, and I show it to you because uh, I think that uh, nine people out of ten will get this wrong. Because when you, this is, these are three simultaneous strips. And uh, what you see in the beginning is what looks like a sinus rhythm 
just running just under 100 beats per minute. I mean, but there's a lot of artifact. There's a lot of jiggly stuff, the patient's moving around. Uh, if, you, if you look at the whole entire strip, you can see over here, there's a lot of very high frequency artifact. But if you carefully analyze it, there does seem to be a P wave that's in all three leads and the QRS that uh, the PR interval is pretty physiologic. And the first three beats, four beats here, there's a fifth beat that all look to be in a normal sinus rhythm at a rate of just under 100 beats per minute. And then right here, you have a wide complex tachycardia. And the QRS complex changes. If you look at the top rhythm strip, instead of just kind of an R wave, you now have an R and a deep S and it's much wider now. And, and it looks a little polymorphic even because like this beat has a double notch and this one is deeper and this beat is taller then it becomes shorter and then taller again. Now it doesn't actually like change axis. It doesn't go from negative to positive. So it's not going to be torsadish kind of VTAC, but Certainly it's wide and, and it's weird looking. And this was labeled as a run of VTAC and actually the patient was having multiple runs like this. And what I always tr tell people and what I, in my last Chalk Talk on ECG Academy every week, I try to do this kind of presentation, but a little bit more polished in just five or six minutes and kind of get to the meat and potatoes of a strip like this. But uh, the last one I showed was a wide complex tachycardia as well. And, it, and, and, I always, and I, what, I, what I taught you during that chalk talk is that 90% of the diagnosis is how it starts and how it ends. Okay, so um, let's look carefully at how this starts. So I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So we can um, see if we can drag it over here. Oops. Okay, here's the beginning. Okay, I take the first two strips first. So you're looking at a very noisy strip. Granted, there's a lot of art, there's a lot of just baseline artifact. Uh, but there does seem to be a P wave here and a QRS and then an, a T wave here and then P, Q, R, S, and then a T. And this is the first beat, we'll call this beat number one of this wide complex tachycardia. So it's wide and it's premature. So you can't really tell if it's atrial or, or if it, atrial with aberrancy or ventricular because of the prematurity. This is what I always teach people is if the beat comes really late, if the first tachycardia beat is really late and it's wide, then it's probably not aberrant because aberrancy occurs because a beat is premature. So if a beat's premature, it gets down the AV node and it winds up hitting the conduction system at a point where part of the interventricular conduction system is refractory. And so it can't get down one branch or another branch and it has to go down another and, and sort of like uh, very gradually work its way around the heart instead of going down the rapid his Purkinje system. So aberrancy occurs for the most part um, when a beat is premature. So if you have a normal rhythm and a normal rhythm and then a wide complex tachycardia that starts really late, it's almost always ventricular because there's no other reason for the QRS to become wide suddenly. So, so widening of the QRS because of aberrancy occurs because, of its, because it's premature. So is this beat premature? Yes, it is. So now the question is, um, where did it start? You always have to look to see if there's a P wave in front of the first beat. Is there? Oop. <laughs> um, I have this drawing tablet and every time I touch it, it seems to... Um, I have to turn the, the touch sensor off. So here's this beat number one. Is there a P wave in front of it? Well, let's look at this T wave preceding the beat and compare it with the previous T wave. And that's what I always say. It's like, find, look like, where's Waldo? One of these beats is not like the other. That was like a kid show, right? Um, 
Maybe it was Sesame Street. I'm showing my New York roots. Anyway, hey, New York, hey, how you doing? How are you? So you got to look at the T-wave here, and you got to look to see if one looks the same as the other. <laughs> anyway, so the, that T-wave looks very smooth, and this T-wave looks very smooth, but this T-wave, oh, dear, there's a bump on it. That bump is a P wave. It's a PAC, a premature atrial contraction. Right there is a PAC. And that PAC is superimposed on the T wave. And it's so early that it manages to get down the AV node, but this QRS conducts aberrantly. And it kind of has an R wave and a deep S. So what type of bundle would you expect it to look like? A right bundle, right? Because the lateral leads in a right bundle branch block generally have a deep S wave. Why? Because the right ventricle is depolarizing late, so you have negative signals going away from one and AVL. And uh, uh, that should, I mean, if you do ECGs, you should, you should pretty much know that. Um, but this, this looks like a rate-related right bundle branch block. Now, what about the rest of the beats? Why does it change? It does change, but nevertheless, if the first beat is atrial, then almost certainly all the rest of the beats are atrial unless there's a marked change in the QRS complex. I mean, you know, I would say 1% of the time, uh, uh, an atrial run will, can induce a ventricular er event. But most of the time, if it starts out being atrial, then the whole thing is atrial. Well, you can, you can see that premature P wave in the other strip down here. So you look at these T waves, they're very, very smooth. And then here, this one has a deformity. It's got a little bump on it. What hump? <laughs> that's from, from Young Frankenstein. So yes, there is a hump there, and that's the PAC that initiates that first beat. And then if you look really carefully, um, it, it, it's hard to see the rest of the P waves because there's so much artifact going on. But nevertheless, all the QRSs kind of sort of look alike, and so chances are there's just variable interventricular conduction disturbance depending upon the rate. You can see it's a little irregular. Uh, this R to R interval is clearly uh, wider, longer than this R to R interval. That might explain why this QRS looks a little wider than the previous one. You see how much wider that S wave is? So there's a sort of a rate related, and, and these two beats, these last two beats are very fast, and they're so wide that they actually have a notch in them. So this is all variable degrees of aberrant conduction. So this is an atrial arrhythmia, atrial tachycardia, perhaps. Uh, could it be atrial fibrillation? You can't tell because it's too much artifact. But this is atrial and it has aberrant conduction. Now, the funny thing, what I find is that um, most of the time um, when, when someone is shown a wide complex tachycardia, you know, this, that the stigma of diagnosing VTAC is, is like too much, you know. So sometimes you'll see these uh, wide complex tachycardias. They may be a little bit irregular. They may be a little bit slow. But a lot of people just assume it's atrial because they don't want to give the diagnosis of VTAC to the patient. But, but you have to just be accurate. You have to look at these things and analyze it and decide what it is and, and not just kind of guess. That's the problem is that when, when I open up a chart, I'll find a lot of rhythm strips. Um, when, I, when I open up a chart, I, I can almost always find a rhythm strip that's been mislabeled because either someone was uh, afraid to call VTAC or someone assumed that something like this was VTAC and, and didn't look carefully for that P wave that started the, the event. So this one of the hardest things to do is diagnosing a wide complex tachycardia. But the vast majority of the time you can figure out what it is if you look at the details and know what you're looking for and just analyze it from a physiologic standpoint and not just rely on pattern recognition. So I hope that was a um, um, uh, useful discussion for all of you guys out there who are in the trenches reading ECGs every day. And um, uh, Zahra Hussein is from Saudi Arabia. Thank you for joining. 
And, and Ricardo asks, does the AV node depend on the 220 minus age rule? You know, that's a really good question. It doesn't. So he's referring to the maximal predicted heart rate of 220 minus your age. And that has to do with the sinus node. How fast would you expect the sinus node to be able to go if you put somebody on a treadmill and used a cattle prod and made them like exercise to the maximal capacity? So that 220 minus age, you know, doesn't always hold up because people can be on meds or people can get old, they could get sick sinus syndrome. But for the most part, that has to do with sinus node. The AV node is unrelated. You can have sinus node dysfunction and have a very healthy AV node. And so that's, that's really the cause of a lot of problems with tachybrady syndrome, where the patient's sinus rate might be slow, could be in the 40s or 50s, but then when they go into atrial fibrillation, the AV node conducts so rapidly that they're, suddenly their ventricular rate's 150. And, and you have to give them something to slow the AV node, but what is that gonna do to their sinus node? I mean, at a rate of 45 or 50, they may not be symptomatic during bradycardia, but as soon as you put them on a beta blocker or a calcium blocker to control their rapid rates, then suddenly their sinus node is gonna be so slow, it's gonna cause problems. So sinus node function and AV node function are often unrelated. You can even have normal sinus node and complete heart block. So, so the answer is no, that doesn't really apply. And uh, the, the health of the AV node has somewhat to do with age. So older people tend to conduct less well. Younger people tend to conduct faster at faster rates. And remember this concealed conduction. So the faster the atrial rate is, the more AV block you'll encounter. So ventricular response during um, very fast arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation tend to be slower than slower atrial arrhythmias like atrial tack or atrial flutter. Uh, but you know, everything is possible. So the, the 220 minus age rate doesn't, doesn't apply. Um, so I hope this was a, a useful discussion. If you enjoy this content, again, please subscribe so that next time I have one, you'll get notification. I'm trying to do this uh, Saturdays, but eventually I'm gonna be setting up a new studio in my basement. It's gonna be a little bit more conducive. The lighting's gonna be a little bit better, but. Uh, I'm glad you were able to tune in. And, um, and remember, ecgacademy.com, there's a link for that as well if you want to get a new lesson every week. I do these chalk talks uh, that are really fun and most of them are pretty advanced. And then the whole ECG course online is including some advanced content that you don't get anywhere else. All right, so um, thanks for watching and tuning in and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day and I um, uh, hope you uh, enjoy the weekend as well.